My name is Marina. And I'm Vina. <laughs> Vina. And um, so before we actually do anything, so we plan this as more of an interactive workshop than a two hour, like an hour and a half lecture. Um, so we have activities for you, and we need you to be in groups. So pairs, okay. so a group of three and a group of two. Um, and if you're not too comfortable like sitting super close to each other, that's fine, but just know that you're, we're gonna ask you to work like together. Yeah, this soon. Some <laughs> Very soon, actually. Um, so, Vina, yeah, feel free to jump in, whatever. Yeah, I mean, so far so good. <laughs> so we just um, thought we would cover the basics of public speaking here. Um, and so we have six general themes that we're going to discuss together. For each theme, there is like a short activity. Um, we're going to start with speech anxiety. It's the first thing you, you kind of learn about when you learn about public speaking. We'll talk about audience application, organization, um, introductions and conclusions, visual aids and speaking style and delivery. And at the end, if you have any questions, we can chat. Yeah. I mean, so something that doesn't come up in, right. in this discussion that you know is relevant to your context. And also feel free to interrupt us at any point during, during this, right? So we're gonna start with speech anxiety and your uh, starting right away in pairs, uh, we're going to give you like two to three minutes to just discuss if you experience your experience with speech, speech anxiety. So what causes it for you? Uh, what are the symptoms? How do you generally cope with it? If you have any specific like coping mechanisms or anything like that. So just in your groups for two or three minutes. And yeah, it can be that. something that's just from one time experience or it's something that's, that you know is common to your several experiences. Yeah, broad interpretation. If you want to move, um, to just be close to it. Do we do this in groups because it was like four? I mean, yeah. 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 I, I think we can do it yeah. individually yeah. also, that's and true. we can just go, yeah, that's, that's true. true. We did this because we thought it was going to be a <laughs> large crowd. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. Very popular. OK, so why don't we get started? Uh, if you want to take a minute to actually think, that's fine. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess I should give you a minute to think about it, and then we can talk about it. We can serve as examples, I guess. OK. So I can talk about my uh, symptoms, I guess, first. Mine is talking too fast. I, I mean, for a couple of reasons. One, because of being multilingual, and sometimes I have the tendency to speak faster in my mother tongue, and so then when I translate to English, I get, I speak really fast, not thinking that it's not being perceived as uh, calm and composed sometimes. And I'm not always, it's not always a sign of anxiety in my head, but for someone else it might come off as that. So. Or the other way around. Sometimes I might think that this looks too anxious and someone else might be like, oh, well, just her style. So that's something that I see, I experience. I speak faster when I know that there is a lot of content to cover. Sometimes that, so planning well, knowing exactly how much to speak on a topic, how much time have I got, how many people are listening, and how much time do they have to ask me questions about it. All of these things kind of factor into that. And so that's um, that kind of causes it, so the large crowd, the context a little bit causes it, um, and I cope, usually I cope with it by breathing. That's, I mean, it's a very basic thing, but the very core of speaking well is having like enough wind in your lungs, basically, enough air in your lungs so that you can feel calm. That's very physiological. That's me. Oh, for me, um, I'm, at least I used to be a very, very anxious speaker <laughs> and for no particular reasons just like speaking in front of others is intimidating to me or it was intimidating, intimidating to me uh, so in terms of the symptoms I would speak fast stutter especially in English uh, at first being really insecure about my linguistic skills in English um, what else blush a lot <laughs> Which really nice. It's really nice with the mask because nobody yeah, gets nice. <laughs> and then how do I cope with it? Um, not with breathing, but uh, I guess like I tend to like over well not over prepare but put a, a lot of like time into preparation and practice a lot. And so if I go and teach, like my lecture is going to be prepared almost by the minute because that's how I cope with my with my anxiety. Um, that and before I have a presentation, I just try to like be, find distraction, like talk to other people or have conversations so that I'm just not, you know, not just in my head, like overthinking what may happen as I'm speaking. 
So I guess, yeah, the, these are my, my coping strategies, like my go-to coping strategies. So, okay, yeah. I guess that stimulated, might have stimulated some thoughts. Thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go in any direction. Yeah, what? sorry. Yeah, uh, so it's kind of like, uh, I'm not sure like, uh, whether the audience uh, able to hear me, am I loud enough or uh, I'm like below a uh, certain level uh, or anything that comes in mind and uh, like if I'm speaking correctly, are they getting my idea or topic, whatever mm -hmm. uh, I'm speaking about. So that goes and then I set up uh, like whether I'm uh, correctly uh, able to speak in correct uh, sentence or something like that that goes like and uh, like coping up with it like uh, I focus on the topic mainly instead of audience so mm -hmm. kind of like that relieves the pressure and I'm able to speak freely so that's okay yeah, yeah that's uh, we can discuss it at the end I guess we can all share for it yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's, for me, it's the same thing. I have to remind myself to, uh, to not feel obliged to just get through the content as quickly as I can. That's a symptom. So what confidence speaking is portrayed, like what we think of in perception, what, who's a good speaker, and the perception is usually somebody who's very like humorous, very confident in their language, is able to like be very flamboyant, and that's something that at least theoretically in communication, that's not necessarily effective. Yeah. Oftentimes it can be poor communication, facade in a facade, like kind of pretending to be good communication often. So that's, that's the thing to remember, is like when you are questioning your language, then that's um, it's, it's good that you do, it's good that you want to get better, but that's not the benchmark. The benchmark is not fluent English, right? That's not the only thing, that's one part of it, and that's, mm -hmm. for most of us, on this planet, speaking in English is the second language, more people speak English as a second language than the first, yeah. right? So for most of us, it's, it's about having to learn new vocabulary as we go. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so yeah, that's, thanks for sharing that, and we'll talk about that also. Mm -hmm. And last question. Yeah, I'll share. Um, for me, I feel like sometimes um, a lot of the ums come up for sure. Uh, but I think I just use that as a way to like pace myself because I speak very fast sometimes. Mm -hmm. And also, usually, I've struggled with this before. It's like my mind, no matter how much I prepare myself, even if I'm presenting, 
I will often have moments of just like, my mind will just go blank. You go blank, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I forget all my talking points. I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, like, I feel like I'll be just rambling on and I'm not like connecting with the person listening to me. Yeah. I've struggled with that a little bit before, but I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah. But that's, yeah, one of my biggest problems is speech anxiety. Yeah. Apparently going blank is like a, rea like a physiological reaction. So because you don't breathe really well, there's something about blood flow and basically your thoughts get confused. So like pausing and trying to breathe can help with that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if it's already happened, then you can <laughs> mitigate that. But if, it's, if it hasn't happened yet, then you can just try to think about breathing. And but, I, yeah. I want to add, because I think that's also kind of goes back to perception of what good speaking is, because we feel like in an uninterrupted just flow of thoughts is what yeah. good speaking is, mm -hmm. which is not in reality how communication works. You interact, you respond. If someone looks confused, you'd be like, I'm sorry, did, I, did you not get my point? And then you start, you pause. In a real context, you're not just speaking at empty faces. You, and so I yeah. un understand your strategy of ignoring the audience. But one of the things that you have to understand is your confidence grows when you're actually in, engaging. You feel more like you're talking to human beings. You're not just performing, yeah. you're interacting. So that it's kind of counterproductive to think of it like, I'll just know my content, close my eyes, not look at anybody, and just make that speech that I decided two months ago that I was going to make, right? It doesn't work like that. And I think a lot of the times the freezing and the needing to breathe is also that like thinking that you have to speak uninterrupted, whether or not people get me, whether or not there is a physical, there's like a, somebody's phone going off. Nobody's expecting you to keep talking through that phone ringing, right? Pause, say, well, can, can you please take care of that? Or whatever, you know, you know, acknowledge that that interruption happened. Acknowledge that it's a human thing to happen and then move on. And that can actually help you feel more centered, more in, in the present, mm -hmm. rather than some pre-recorded speech that you have like, you know, in your system and it has to be regurgitated just the way you planned it. That's not how it works. So it's a, a bunch of good things and I, I wanted to yeah. say one quick thing. Um, I like that you acknowledge, you acknowledge that you feel anxious in the moment and someone else acknowledged, I think it was you, who acknowledged that once you get there, it's, uh, you get less anxious. So that it's very useful also to think about the pre, the anticipation kind of anxious anxiety versus the uh, in between the speech anxiety where you can, you can freeze, you can have a sense, sense of like forgetting your thoughts, train of thought. And then also there's the post anxiety. Sometimes after you made the speech, you're all shaken up. I've experienced that, like I make a, it's something especially with a large stake, right? If I'm making a conference presentation and someone I know, I want to be noticed by. So it's sometimes it's not in the moment because I'm too focused and then it's after I'm like, did it go well? <laughs> and I'm shaking after, for like 25 minutes after I made that speech, I'm shaking still. So remembering which phase of your speaking is causing you the most anxiety is kind of important. Um, and acknowledging, just knowing that that's something to expect from your yeah. physiological reaction is can be kind of desensitized, can be kind of make you desensitized and know your body better, right? Know that you're gonna, next time you speak, you're gonna experience that perhaps. And knowing that can help quite a bit. Also for like filler words, people tend to, like relating to your first response, people tend, tend to think that um, good public speaking, so they overemphasize the delivery aspect of speaking, right? And so a lot of people tend to think, well, if I don't have any words, like filler words in my presentation, that's what makes my, um, my talk or my speech effective. Um, having ums and likes and filler words is just part of human communication. You're not going to erase that. And in fact, having a few of them in your speech isn't going to take away from the effectiveness of your presentation and your communication. So they can become distracting if someone uses a filler word like every other sentence, you know, they, they close the sentence with that word and they, they keep repeating it, that, that becomes problematic because it's distracting. But having a few likes and ums here and there is just part of, I really think we need to de-dramatize that because it's really not a big deal. It's part of normal communication. Yeah. So, yeah. That yeah, there's a lot of like sociolinguistic study on how, why people use these kinds of fillers. The um part might not be that obvious, but like the use, the use of like, for example, somebody studied in the UK, a uh, sociolinguist study, the use of like, she was just observing people on a train and she was basically studying this thing, phenomenon of what demographic was using like more often and so on and so forth. This is a longitudinal study, so it took uh, several years and then she kind of published material on that and she found that for a lot of people, it was a way of connecting, uh, to explaining. It was not a filler in the way that we traditionally understand it. It was a way of like saying, 
it's something like this, or kind of connecting with the audience. I mean, of course, the, her, her explanation of it is much more detailed than how I am producing it here. But the point is that, so there are, there are functions that language have, and of course, it's useful to think of getting rid of some of the distracting mannerisms, but it's not productive to think of everything as a problem to that perfect uh, image of a good speech that you have. And it can always often get in the way of mm. actually focusing on the message, focusing on the audience, realizing that they are the people that ultimately have to understand what you're saying. And that's, that's a successful speech, right? One that people get. People can go back home and be like, I learned something today. And that's, yeah. if you focus on that, you feel a little bit less conscious about those fillers and those little things that, that are actually not consequential always. I think we can. Yeah, we should probably, <laughs> probably move. Keep moving. Yeah, a lot of time here. <laughs> okay. So first of all, um, if you are, if you experience any level of anxiety, whether you have high anxiety, mild anxiety, or totally manageable speaking anxiety, is normal. Like eighty percent of people experience speech anxiety to some level. So that's something that really, when you think about public speaking, you need to de-dramatize um, and realize that zero anxiety or no anxiety at all is not is not the goal. Um, Acknowledge that you are anxious and try to, like first of all, greeting your anxiety is, is going to take that pressure off, some of that pressure off, because you know you're anxious and you're anxious about being anxious and looking anxious and all of these things. So accepting that it's just normal to have and experience speech anxiety in the first place will help you in the long run. Um, what happens is we talked about the physiological response. The fight or flight Yeah, fight or flight. So you get sweaty, uh, your heart beats faster, all of these. No, yeah. I mean, these are reactions about. that your body doesn't tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if I cut your thought. Yeah, no. No, okay. Yes, yeah, so I was just saying <laughs> the response that you have basically uh, it to a physical threat versus the fear of. So phobia is ultimately still a fear of some kind. You can have a fear of an animal that is, you know, threatening you or attacking you, Creep. but it's. Your body can the sensories don't work don't don't work to distinguish them as much so you do feel the real fear yeah. of speaking it's it is a fear it's a phobia uh, glossophobia right public speaking so that's it's it happens and it's physiological and knowing that can actually make you feel like it's a human thing some people have more experience making more speeches so they they're used to it and learn learn from observation that's something I prefer a lot I look at people and be like how are they coping what are what are their symptoms I try to like analyze, which is sometimes useful, sometimes you can't tell. Yeah, when I when you start looking at people, like usually you become able to really identify what their symptoms are. And it really helps me because it feels, I feel like, okay, like everyone has some, some sort of symptom when it comes to their own speech anxiety. Um, so just repeating one of the slides here. Yeah. But, so it's not about zero anxiety. Actually also being, having like, some level of managed anxiety can like boost your performance. I don't like to think about communication like as a performance, but um, because you're a little anxious, you feel like something is at stake, you're gonna push yourself more. So in a lot of cases, it's actually going to enhance your, your, your talk, your communication, to be a little anxious. Um, so it's more about managing the symptoms than really getting rid of your anxiety. It's about learning how to understand the causes and using the coping strategies. And you talked, well, you talked about to coping strategies already. I think I had that also with now this uh, with a student. Um, the way I evaluate my students when they make speeches, if you sound too not nervous, too casual, often your speech is just as you're ringing it. Blah. I mean, I'm sorry. Sometimes it is because you don't seem invested. You know, you if you are too casual about something, yeah. you can't get people to sit up and listen. You have to have some sense of conviction. It has to show in your body. And it sometimes shows as anxiety. Sometimes, like for me, I know it's my loudness, my toughness, whatever. But sometimes, I mean, I try to try to monitor it a little bit. I try to check, keep, keep it under check. But I know that it also, some, for some people, it translates as my passion. And it translates as my being engaged. My, I never have any of my student evals. Nobody will ever say she is not interested in the topic. Like, they'll say a lot of things. A lot of bad things about me, but it's not, never that, never the thing that I'm not, you know, invested in the topic that I'm teaching, uh, because that's one of the criteria for student evals. So that's, so I think that's also realizing that anxiety is a sign of being invested in yeah, something. Yeah, that you care about it. It can be really, yeah. yeah, that you care, the consequences matter to you. And that can be kind of infectious, that can make people be like, oh, well, they care, I should probably have listened to, uh, to see what they have to say about it. Yeah. 
Um, so going back to this slide, uh, we talked about some of the causes, but some like general things that happen for people who experience anxiety are listed here. So, <laughs> and I recommend myself in a few of them. Actually, catastrophizing is when you're like thinking, what is going to happen? I'm going to go blank. Like I'm going to, I don't know, pass out on stage because I'm too nervous. Like you want to say too many likes. Yeah, you're going like on a mental like kind of thing about what might happen to you. Um, you're seeking perfection or complete approval. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Looking yeah. For perfection, like you want everyone in your everyone audience to be love like, you. wow. <laughs> um, so obviously that adds a lot of pressure. Being nervous about looking nervous, I think is so underrated because I think it's like a really big reason why people get nervous. Like, cause you think it's so visible that you're there like dying in front of an audience because you're nervous, right? But most of the time, yeah, people are gonna be able to tell that you're a little nervous maybe, but not nearly as much as you might imagine. Um, so it's good to keep that in mind. And then being at the center of attention, being in an unfamiliar situation, if you're speaking on stage and it's the first time in your life that you, you are on a stage, it's really intimidating. Um, so the, the familiarity of the situation really uh, plays a role in, in the level of anxiety that you might have. I'll tell you a secret. I was asked to host the Diwali night. I don't know if you know this. It's Indian night. I was asked. And it's, I know it's like 400 people or something going. And I, I was like, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> like they were asking me to be the, whatever, the main uh, host for the, for the evening or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm going to think about that. I'm not doing it now. I mean, well, it's also because I'm busy. It's not just because I'm running away from uh, an exciting opportunity. But it made me nervous. I thought, well, I've never actually, if, if I think for about sure. it, I've taught a class of like 75, which is the largest crowd I've spoken to. And that's, so I got a little nervous about that. Yeah. No, no time. <laughs> so sort of identifying why you're feeling nervous is the first stage of you being able to cope with your anxiety. You understand what's going on, you understand why you're nervous, and you normalize that. You're just like, okay, this is what ha what's happening. I'm experiencing this and this symptom, and this is the reason why. Like, I don't know the place, um, I don't know the people, everyone's gonna be looking at me, whatever it might be, right? So that's kind of like identifying what causes your anxiety is one of the first steps in learning to manage it or manage the symptoms. And then in terms of coping strategies, I don't know if you wanna talk about something um, in particular here. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, if my personal ones I kind of shared. I do think uh, a lot of the uh, things that we said in terms of perspectivizing, recognizing that you, when you get nervous, uh, I actually, one thing that uh, Marina said earlier, which is like talking and distracting, talking to someone else and distracting right before your speech. So if you're gonna make a speech, like don't be thinking about it until the last second until you get on there. I don't know if it works for you, if it works for you, great. But I know that for me, stepping away helps a little bit. So initially, I used to just like run up and down stairs, like just to get my heart rate going. Like once you are just breathing, once you're just kind of like tired and you're so focused on your body, if you get yourself physically tired, trust me, nothing is gonna bother you as much as just like getting that so I've done that. I used to just run up and down the stairs a little bit and then oh, now I am ready. <laughs> so I feel that that distraction works for me. Uh, it could be something else, push-ups. I know I, have a, I had a student who was always doing push-ups yeah. but right before a speech and he'd be like, can I step aside <laughs> before I speak? I'm like, maybe this time I'll let you since it's a speaking class and I want you to perform well. This but that, that happens. Being, so, in the, being in the present moment helps you like not just be in your head and focus on that. Like little secret, I don't know if you've ever experienced that in there, I don't feel like you're a nervous speaker, but when I started uh, with GSD and I was on the e-board, like you're just, so at the beginning when you have to give your updates as a member of the e-board, you're just like sitting there waiting for everyone to talk and then you know you have to talk and like the first times that I was in that situation I thought it was <laughs> awful because you're just sitting in silence waiting for your turn to speak and that's like anxiety and so in that situation, I didn't have a coping, well, preparation and practice, like I knew what I was going to say. Um, so preparation and practice is really not exciting because it's not a miracle, <laughs> like kind of solution against speech anxiety, but I mean, honestly, like it's probably the most, e personally for me, it's the most effective thing. Like you know what you're going to do, you've done it a couple of times, especially, depends on the stakes of your presentation, right? But if it's like a high stake, formal presentation and you practice it in front of people, makes a huge difference to practice in front of people. Um, it's not nice because you don't want to be asking your friends to just be like, hey, can you watch my presentation? But it helps 
it makes a huge difference as opposed to practicing alone. Um, so if you've done that, you will feel more confident for sure. Then know the phases of speech anxiety is what Dina was talking about. There are four phases, like that anticipation phase where you know you're gonna speak and like your anxiety is starting to rise. And then the minute where you're just there about to speak and you begin speaking is where your anxiety is going to be at, at its highest. And then as you talk, it, it goes away, like it starts decreasing until, until you're done and then it's like, um, and then one of my favorites is the performance orient getting rid of the performance oriented perspective. It has a lot to do with understanding communication as a performance. So like you're on stage, you're giving a performance, the audience is here to judge you. And that's kind of how we think about it as a performance. And if you really, and it takes time and practice to do that, but if you really manage to switch that from a performance oriented perspective to a communication oriented perspective where your goal is to communicate a clear message to the audience as opposed to seeing them as your judges. You're seeing them as like people that you're having a conversation with. It really helps. Um, it's not easy, like for me it takes quite a bit of practice to yeah. be able to like establish that and cons it, you also constantly have to think about okay, not a performance, I'm having a conversation with you, I'm not just talking at you for like 20 minutes. Yeah. It really helps de-dramatize the speaking situation. I think one way that I try to do this, and so each phase has different strategies, right? The prior anxiety will be like going up and down the stairs, breathing, these things you can't do in the middle of your speech. <laughs> so yeah, that's for the prior phase, just to be clear. But in the, in the, uh, in the context, so maybe at the start of the speech, think about what if you acknowledge somebody in the audience and like, hey, how are you doing? How's your day? How is that gonna make you feel? As, like when you actually then five minutes later have to make the speech. That's gonna, de like at least one familiar face will already make that difference. So I think not, not looking at the audience um, is actually useful because having had an interaction, if you're there five or 15 minutes before, you acknowledge, you ask them how they are. And if you know them, uh, it's even better. You can actually strike some small talk. Uh, but I do think that that's also, so that's right before the speech, and then there's a, obviously the post one. But the post one's the easiest, because you've done the deed, <laughs> and you just have to deal with your own consequences, so you can talk to yourself, <laughs> whatever, maybe talk to a person that you feel most comfortable talking about these things. So there's, there's that post. But I do think that in the moment, acknowledging breaking the ice with your audience is very useful, and it's very underrated. We think that, oh, I'm here, I guess I'm not looking at them until I have to start speaking for everyone. And that's not how it works. It's just... Again, diffuse that tension, diffuse the feeling that you get from just having to look at people in their eyes and just be like, well, I'm going to acknowledge and ask you how you're doing so that next time I look at you when I'm making my speech, I'm gonna feel more comfortable speaking to you because I know you now. Just at least have broke the ice. So, yeah. That's what we have to say about that. <laughs> Hopefully you will identify, go through the process of like asking yourself which phase makes most difference to you and what strategies you might come up with for, for yourself in that. Yeah. Moving on. I have a question. Yes. So obviously you sometimes we know that, you know, in situations where let's say we're preparing for a speech, for a talk, uh, we have our slides, uh, and there's always technical problems, not always, but there's technical problems that arise. Yeah. What would you say is a decent coping strategy to like, you know, let's just say like five minutes before you go on, mm -hmm. guy runs up and says, hey, like we don't have your slides. like." We're trying to find it, blah, blah, blah. How, what would be the best way, and you're starting to stay calm because you know you're still gonna have to go on stage, but how, how would you try to cope in that type of moment? And it's happened, actually, it's to happened. both of us, it's, it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> it happened to me that I had, it was one of the first times that I was teaching my public speaking class, actually, and I had like a 15 minute lecture with slides that I really prepared, and then I go to class and the computer wasn't working. <laughs> So I didn't have slides. Um, so in the moment, I was I had like a, a panic for a half second. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> I was like, I'm a, how am I going to lecture for like 15 minutes, you know, without slides? Um, the only thing that saved me in that moment is that I'm anxious, <laughs> and so I really prepared my lecture to the point that I knew each, <laughs> like I knew everything. So I, I could go without my slides. Um, but in general, like I would say. First of all, if you, so if it's a minor technical difficulty, you can just like acknowledge it and kind of 
laugh about it. And if it's just like a five minute thing, you're just like, hey, sorry, this happened, this is a live presentation. Like it's not, it's no big deal. Um, if it's more serious, like your slides aren't there for your entire presentation, I mean, it depends on the occasion. If it's like a high, high stake occasion, definitely have a backup plan. Like have your laptop with your slides or like just think in advance, like what if the technology doesn't work, right? Yeah. Um, if it's on Zoom and it's an internet issue, there is not much you can do about it. I don't know. I yeah. don't feel like I have a <laughs> specific thing for that. I think when, for me, the coping for that is very similar to everything you said. Um, but I, the way I try to obviously know your content. So if you know the structure of where you're going to start and where you're going to end, you already kind of feel okay with that to go, you know, on the fly. What is that all about me? And it's all, all about what I know and what I want to share. It's about them. What do they know? Where do they come from? What can they do and learn from me? What can I equip them to better understand the next time they talk about or learn about this topic? When that, that process can really be, again, it can help with anxiety, but it can obviously also make the speech better just because you consider these factors more actively rather than just thinking, oh, this is just an objectively great speech. Yeah. Nothing like that, right? There's never an objectively great speech, just one that is doing a good job connecting with the people. And I find with audience adaptation, like the one tricky thing is that um, when you're making a speech, you have to like really find that balance between making guesses about who your audience is, so what they need, what they're expecting to hear, like what they want, like you have to kind of guess all of that based on who you think they are. So in terms of demographics, right? Um, their age, their, I don't know, nationality, gender, all of that, their culture. So you're making all of these guesses, but you have to find a balance to not also fall into stereotypes and just categorize people, categorize your audience based on who you think they are. Um, so you have to do some categorizing and like, guessing without falling on that other side of it, which is like more stereotyping and restricting in a way. Um, so that's the, the tricky part about audience adaptation is that you have to think about your speech, your speech in those terms, like who is my audience, but at the same time, my audience is going to be, I don't know, five different people. Yes, they have things in common, but they're all individuals with different points of views, experiences, and all of that. So how do I, how do I cope with that, you know, the differences between them? Um, so that's the, I would say, the main challenge with, with audience adaptation. Um, let's see. But expectation is also important. So yeah. Again, 3MC will have a certain expectation yeah. of what you're supposed to be doing well, which is breaking it down for a lay audience. In other contexts, that's not the expectation. The expectation might be a more high sophisticated level of conversation. In that case, you can kind of take certain things for granted. So it's very dynamic, like it's very contextually specific, and you have to think about who, what, when, where these things matter. Alright. Yeah, so quickly for audience adaptation, um, three general things to do. So thinking about that balance between, you know, making educated guesses, generalizations, and identifying the needs um, of your audience. We talk about building identification. Um, so that comes with telling stories, uh, making your speech relatable to your audience in a way. Um, so again, take some some guesses. It also comes with your style of speaking, the accessibility of your language. If you speak in a way that most people, it is too abstract or in a way that most people are not gonna be able to follow, you can be sure that in five minutes, nobody's gonna be listening to you anymore, right? If it's too inaccessible for them. Um, credibility, so credibility, like <laughs> a lot of things go into credibility and you're going to develop your credibility as a speaker as you speak throughout the entire presentation by how you're prepared, the content that you have, how you um, choose and present your evidence, all of these things. But it's more than that, it's also in terms of the delivery and how you talk with people. Um, and it, and, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I do want to add, when we talk about identity, uh, identification and credibility, one of the factors is um, realize that a speech is a speech, right? It's not, you're not writing a paper, so you might have the same content ultimately to deliver. You've written a paper and you're gonna talk about your research. Think about TED Talk. When a good TED talk will always, the, 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 if it's a scientist, in, in case it is, uh, usually tells you the story of that researcher. Why did they come to that question? What one fine day made them ask that question? How did they arrive at 
a certain method to address that question. So it's not exactly, I researched this, therefore I'm going to give you 500 pieces of evidence why you should also think like this. That's boring, that's not a story, that's not going to work. It's good in terms of your research itself, right? It's the content. It is true that you are, you've done your work, you are credible, but your job is not to just assume that you're credible, therefore they'll listen. Your job is to tell them your story, right? So I, I personally think that yeah. no matter what it is, you can always think of what you're speaking in terms of narratives. You can tell people a story. It can be something as basic as an anecdote. So I had this experience as a child, and so I asked this question. My research, I dedicated my research career to this question that I stumbled upon when I was a 15 year old kid. Not saying that's the case, right? Like it could be, or it couldn't be. It could be something, but something sparked your interest in what you're talking about. And that story is, is critical, it's crucial for them to know, to feel like, what is my question? And that's also a thing, like if you want them to relate with you, they're going to only be able to do that if you equip them with a story, not just with random pieces of evidence and information about something. So that's, I think personally, that really helps with identity and credibility because they will think not now they'll think of you as somebody who knows the topic but also somebody who knows to tell the story on it who knows to explain to people that they can also have similar questions or similar stories and that's that's really what you're doing you're making a speech you're not just relaying information do what you will with it right that's not your job so yeah just wanted to add that to yeah that. that's a really good point actually um did we so yeah just the last thing is being sensitive to your audience reactions. Obviously, you're talking to people, so <laughs> if um, you have, I don't know, six people in your audience, or seven, and they're all sleeping on their tables, that tells you something, and you sh should probably do something about it. So don't be afraid to like, obviously, if we're talking about something like the three minute competition, right, that's a different specific context, but in general, when you're talking to people, even if it's just a lecture, like be sensitive to what is going on, to what your audience is telling you, and don't hesitate to like stop and adapt to that. Ask questions um, like, how is it going? Are you following? Is this boring? Should I move on? You know, um, instead of just, you're not just talking, again, it's all about talking with people instead of talking at people. You don't want to be talking at people. That's not the point of good communication. Yeah, so focus on the audience, make the eye contact, get the cues. If they're, they're looking lost, acknowledge it. Try to, try to remedy that, try to, Make it a human context, right? Interact. Yep. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so now I want you to look at this random uh, list, I think 20 letters, and memorize it. I'll give you a few seconds. Um, you set a timer? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Right? <laughs> Looked at it? All good? Memorize it? Okay, can we... Can we Oh my gosh, that was quick. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point. Otherwise, they have five hours to, to memorize that and they don't, know, they don't get the trick. So, who can re repeat the sequence? I can try. Okay, I want you to give it a shot. M-D-P-H-E-I-H-O. It's I-H-O. Okay. All the letters, it's just, I'm lost on the I don't mind. Okay, good. I think it was GIF, right? Was it GIF at the end? TGIF. Okay, wonderful. So you messed up the sequence. <laughs> so you failed the test. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's go to the next slide. What happens when we change and make clusters out of it? MD, PhD, RSVP, IHOP, TGIF. Okay, so you got some of it. You got actually most. Maybe you messed up the sequence here and there a little bit. Uh, and this is consequential because your information isn't just random things, it's things that have to build on what you just said. So there's a logical sequence in which the way, uh, in the way that you arrange your speech, right? When you put it in clusters, it becomes much easier to memorize. Um, can you have the next slide? The MD and the PhD are as we keep to the CEOs of IHOP and TGIF. This becomes a narrative. Um, the reason we use it, I, I, I'm using this as a prompt for you to think about is obviously not because I want you to memorize that and there's any consequence to that, but because when you convey information about something to your audience, there is a risk that you might have too much in there without a clear sense of how it's organized or how they're supposed to remember it. Uh, and there's, there used to be this um, idea of human memory, at least in cognitive science, they would study you know, human memory, and there used to be the magic number used to be seven. 
I think it was a psychologist called George Miller who made this study in the 50s or something, who said the magic number of human memory is seven. People can remember seven things at any, you know, in any sequence, or perhaps he didn't say it in any sequence, but let's just assume that he just said, seven's the magic number of human memory. You can give them seven facts and you can expect them to remember it. Obviously, you had more. The first unit was 20 units, right? So that was 20 separate units of things that you had to remember. Um, and then we kind of condensed that, and this became one unit. So seven got challenged, and I think the more contemporary idea is that you can remember up to three things really well, if, if it's well presented. So three, you know, you can say, my research question. Here's what caused me to have this question. Here was the real question, and here's the solution. That's three pieces of information, and that gets very easily um, graspable for people. So you, you'll find that a lot of speeches are about three things. If you now go back and observe a lot of effectively done speeches, you're like, so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about one, two, three. You'll find that, and that's a very, I think it's a very innate thing for human beings now to do because, and that people study it in retrospect, right? They're like, what works well as a communication, uh, as, a, as effective communication? So that's something that I like to think. And what you've done by making a narrative out of those random 20 units is you've condensed it. Now, this is one unit of your memory. Now this is not 20 separate units because it's one sentence and you can remember a sentence. You're capable of identifying a sentence as a unit. And because you're able to do that, now you can fit in two more pieces of information there. So again, kind of reinforcing, hitting the nail on the head, if you will. Um, narrative is very important. Telling people five different things about the thing you research might not be effective. Telling them how they're connected might be. Weaving it together. So you can have the same amount of information but do a horrible job at conveying that, or you can have the same amount of information and actually show them how it connects, how the thing I just said connects to the thing I'm gonna say next, right? And that matters. So again, in effective communication, you have to think about their memory, your audience. Again, going back to audience uh, adaptation, how are they gonna remember all this information? If I give them 500 different pieces of evidence, pieces of information, how are they gonna remember it if I make a story out of it? I think that's our transition to organization. Yes. <laughs> so the next thing is, I believe, an activity. Yes. Which we might or might not do in Paris. That's up to you. No Paris. I think it's yeah. still fine. So if you have to uh, give a 10 minute informative talk about the Titanic and it's open to interpretation, you can approach that however you want. What are your three main points, let's say? We're talking about organization. If you want to work in Paris, that's fine because if you're like clueless about Titanic, you might. <laughs> Yeah, you can kind of look things up, like, let's just take a few minutes to do that, look things yeah. up, uh, try to come up with like three main points that would make your speech, basically. And we're not asking for anything specific or super elaborated, but. Right. I've never seen it, but I identify the interpretation. Yeah, up to you. <laughs> what you think is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> or both, like, I guess you could find a way of combining both, I feel, but. Uh, yeah, no, well, you could. You say three main things about it. Three main points. Do we have? Do we want to give them more time? Or? Hmm? Yeah, like five, five ish minutes. Yeah, take a few minutes. We can also rest our vocal cords a bit. I don't know if you want to brainstorm as a group or individually or yeah feel free to like talk mm -hmm. that's that's the point in pairs so yeah. and feel free to look things up even <laughs> even looking up things on like wikipedia or something might give you an idea of how people have structured um, information about yeah you can actually pull out your phone and look yeah, at yeah. it I don't know much about the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, it's true. From like 10 years ago, probably that I've seen it, but oh well. So, oh my god, is it still there? Five minutes? I think so. Yeah. I may be even shorter. People are coming up with it quick.
phone died. <laughs> Uh -oh. I think there was oh, like. So you can't really Google anything. You're, you're, I think there was like a loose connection, oh. but it's dead. So I said to record it with my phone. Oh. Yeah, I know. I was all flustered. There might be a little tiny gap. So. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll fix it in post. It's not going to be just by sounds of the speaker. I know. <laughs> no. Don't underestimate yourself. <laughs> No, there's traditionally there's a decent like view viewership number on YouTube. Really? Well, yeah, really for one of them we had like almost twelve hundred views in like a day. What? Yeah, it was wild. I don't know that how. Crazy. Yeah. What was it about? It was a programming workshop. Oh, okay. So well, I'm pretty sure people were just like you know. <laughs> you yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's there though. It's fine. It's the campus. This is where we are. This is what we do. This is what we paid for. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you, what what about this made you, what about these three things did you uh, determine because you thought your audience is right for your audience? Okay, so okay, great, that's your purpose. So you're, you've defined what you're going to try to do with that three. Great, okay. Anyone else? background of the titan like how it is like it is the biggest trip at that time in uh, mm -hmm. its history and then uh, uh, what exactly happened uh, at that time and uh, the last point would be like uh, is there a space on that door that jack could have speculation <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> what was the problem, I guess what was the consequence. 
Well, problem solution would be offering a solution to what happened there. Like, or, or what already happened. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure the way ships are built now are very, is very different than yeah. how it used to be. And whatever, if your technical background allows you to be able to emphasize that, then you are equipped to make a speech about the same topic based on your expertise on something completely different. So yeah. I might not be one to think of, I might think something more about the narrative, right? I might think more about something about like a story that happened. Imagine that you were on this ship and I'm like, I don't know, maybe that would be my prompt, maybe it wouldn't. But the point is I would think because I have a certain disposition, I'm interested in stories, I'm interested in communication, I'm interested in different things, I would come at it from a different perspective. But you may, with your technical background, come at it with very different perspectives. Uh, I don't know about comparative, you can be like, there's another ship that was just fine. Actually, yeah, you could just like, go on that one. You could do that. Uh, you could do that. I mean, ship it's very possible. The point here is or another any ship speech. Even. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything you, any topic you pick can be a narrative in different ways. So you have to ask your rationale. Why am I narrating it in this way? What is it, again, what is it that my audience needs to get out of it? Am I trying to make them laugh? Am I trying to make them understand the technical problems? Am I trying to tell them the history of it? Do they need to know the history of it well enough to understand what it mean, meant in that time? All of that matters, right? So again, the emphasis will be determined by how you organize your speech. Yeah, and move on. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to introductions and conclusions. Um, so I know it sounds kind of dull <laughs> to like talk about introductions and conclusions in speeches. It's really important, um, and essentially that's just because introduction is the first impression you make, and the conclusion is the last impression you make. So the introduction is really important because you might lose your audience in the first 20 seconds of your speech if your in if introduction is not compelling, or if you don't give if you don't give your audience a clear direction as to what like where your speech is going, what are you going to talk about. So introduction, you need to tell your audience what you're going to tell them before you actually do it. That's the point of an introduction. And it's important because people don't want to be listening to something and be like, what, <laughs> what am I listening to this? What is the point of this? It needs to be clear from the beginning. Conclusion, um, last impression as well. So it's kind of the same idea. And it's a nice way of like rem uh, reminding your audience of the main things that you cover. So what is it that people should remember for your speech? from your speech is going to be uh, the, the focus of your conclusion. So these two elements are really important. And often, so people do recognize, I think, the importance of introductions and usually have introductions when they talk. Conclusions, however, <laughs> often are just, uh, well, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> you that's know? what I got. That's what I got. That's really the worst thing. <laughs> it can be two things. It can be because you don't know. You hadn't planned enough. Yeah. You didn't know how much time you had. And if it's genuinely that you didn't know how much time you had, if it's an impromptu speech, that's fine. Yeah. But if you knew you had 10 minutes or 15 minutes from the very start, there's no excuse for not having a conclusion, right? You could have planned it that way. You could have set it up in a way that you have enough time to spare to kind of like, to have the gain your audience's attention at the start, to actually set up the actual discussion and then to conclude and kind of highlight what is it, again, that you want them to take away from that speech, from that talk, right? So this is showing them that you planned well. So you can really, you can lose credibility if you don't have a conclusion. And more often than not, I forget, my, my students, when they make speeches in my class, I will forget what the speech was about if there was no conclusion. Yeah. So whenever students end, because I, two weeks later when I'm looking at grading or whatever, I'm like, what was the speech about again? Because the conclusion really does kind of hit the nail on the head. It tells me, it reminds me what about that speech I had to take away. Yeah. You know, I had to kind of like, what had to resonate in the end. So that really matters and you will forget. If people will forget what you have to say if you do not kind of do that. So people's attention, don't take it for granted. People's ability to remember, don't take it for granted. Help them, aid them in their ability to do these things that you want them to do. Yeah, and to just go back to the thank you, like so to, if you don't have a conclusion because you didn't have time to prep or for whatever reason you don't have a conclusion, um, that's all, or that's all I got, or any kind of statement like that sounds like an apology, right? It doesn't sound conclusive. It sounds like you're like, oh, I don't know what to say now, so that's all I got. It sounds like an apology. So instead of saying that, if you don't have a conclusion, just say, thank you for your attention. And that sort of like completely reframes uh, the end of your speech. Like it marks, it's conclusive, it marks the end. So just a quick thing about the yeah, that's all I got. And if you like really don't have the time, I think that way of ending, like if you really yeah. ran over time because you didn't plan well, 
you can still be graceful about it rather than saying, okay, that's it, my time's <laughs> up. That's not cool. Yeah. You can be like, okay, thank you for attention and I hope you will be able to think about this or whatever. Like if you have a summarized version of what is the key message, then do that. Like have a summarized me uh, version of your message so that at least you can end on that note. So it's better than saying, cool, see, <laughs> bye. I wanna do that. <laughs> Um, so in terms of effective introductions, you might already know all of this, it, it's maybe fairly intuitive. So the attention getter will spend, we'll do a quick activity on attention getters. Purpose statement, significance of topic, speaker's credibility, and preview of your main points. So if you don't have a lot of time and you need to have a really short introduction or you didn't prepare too much, again, for whatever reason, the one thing you need is the purpose statement. Always, it's about telling your audience what you're about to tell them. Like, why am I listening? Why am I why am I sitting here listening to you? It, that needs to be clear from the beginning. So, if you have to have one thing as an introduction, that's going to be it. Um, significance of the topic. It's depending on the context, depending on what you're talking about. It's always nice to show well, or tell your audience why this matters to them, why this is relevant, why they are going to sit and listen to you for a minute. Um, so if that can be established in a few sentences in an introduction, it's always a good thing. And then your credibility, I'm really on the fence with that one. I think again, significance and credibility, I, yeah. I kind of tend yeah. to go back to telling the story, right? I mean, I, for me, it's the start of the speech is not about the technical content, even if it's gonna be a technical speech for the rest of the day. So yeah. the, the kind of, uh, Two, one way to build credibility would just be telling people the story to know, for, so that they know how you got to talking about that thing. So it, you don't have to be like, I am a you know, PhD in neuroscience, therefore you must listen to me. That's not, you know, well that's credibility, but that's not effective way, it's not an effective, telling people I'm a great researcher is not going to do the, the, the work of them trusting you. So there are more nuanced ways of thinking yeah. about how you can communicate to them that you come from a place of knowing something about this topic, right? And that can be a story, that can be an anecdote, that can be uh, asking a question, a provocative question, and that can also kind of tie into attention getters. Mm -hmm. So why are they there? You can set the tone for why they're there by just asking one question at the start of your speech. And you see this, these strategies, are, like she said, you already know these things. You've seen that in other people's speeches. You just don't know when, when you're making a speech, how to apply it. You spend some time thinking about introduction. One thing, yeah, the one method of doing that is actually spend some time thinking about well, how are you going to set your expect their expectations from your speech? And if you do that, then you're already thinking, what kind of question can I ask them to get them to sit up and think about this topic? Mm -hmm. Or what kind of story can make them feel like, hey, I have a question about this too? Like something like that. So that these things can be quite, so they don't have to be like separate yes. categories. When we teach how to write a speech, we usually tell people to write an attention getter, have something, you know, have like a fact or a, a question or a rhetorical question or whatever. Um, but then these things can kind of blur into each other also. Somet sometimes your attention getter can be the way into your credibility statement, which can be the way into your preview of your speech, right? I mean, these can be blurred, and I think it's very valuable to think of them not as a lengthy piece of introduction, but as cru crucial pieces of what gets people to listen. These are crucial pieces. Gaining attention by asking them a question can be indispensable sometimes. You can have a 15 minute speech that does nothing for them if you don't have that one statement at the start. So that's not, again, not a great effective speech at the end because you didn't do that part of getting them into the topic and you just assume that they're interested, taking their interest for granted. It's, it's not going to be, it's gonna be a put off for people. Well, like, why do they think I'm interested in this? Mm -hmm. And for the preview of main points, I think, so all of these things, again, they blur into each other and it's also going to depend on your speech, on the length of the speech, like you don't need to elaborate, you don't need to have an eight minute introduction, right? It doesn't need to be like this substantial thing, it can be really succinct and concise. Um, for a preview of main points, so again, depending on the length of your speech, but if, if it's a formal presentation and you have to speak for 15, 20 minutes, um, try to have a preview. Tell, let people know where, where you're going and where that's gonna go and what your main points are going to be from the beginning. Again, it just like helps with clarity and it helps with engagement. Hi. Um, so we have, wait, I'm not sure what's next, right? Yes, in terms of attention getters, um, so <laughs> we had a question, I think, um, in the CMT panel the other day about do we have to ask a question when we start a speech? 
it's a very common attention getter, right? So most people, actually some people feel like they have to use the question as a way to engage the audience to begin it. Um, the short answer to that is you can, it can be a really great way to hook your audience. It can also be bad, it really depends on how you do it. So if you're asking a question to your audience, two things. You have to be, you have to know that you might get responses that you don't anticipate. So you're expecting your audience to react a certain way. Like how many of you have done this? And then, no one's done and then, yeah, and then well, how you do with that? So you have to be able to bounce from that. And then the second thing is when you ask a question, even if you get the answer that you expected, then what do you do with it? I see so many presentations from my students where they're like, so how many of you have ever, I don't know, done whatever thing? Wait surfing. Yeah, <laughs> and then so a few people raise their hands and it's like, okay, cool, moving on. What is the connection to your students? Why <laughs> do you have a question there? So that questions can be a really good attention getter, right? Because it engage, like you, you're asking the audience to be active and participate, but if you don't tie that into the rest of your introduction, it's just it defeats defeats the purpose. People are gonna be like, "What are you doing?" And same thing with like something else. Like you might be like, "Imagine you're on a cruise ship, and then nothing about the cruise ship ever comes up again in the speech, or like it's just yeah. completely like left hanging for the rest of the speech." So do this, but do it strategically. Just doing it to fit into a certain mold of a good speech is not the purpose, right? It's knowing what you want to do again. What do you want your people to, your audience to imagine? If there is something you want them to imagine, great. There's not, then don't make it like that. Yes. Can you make a question um, with what you're anticipating as your answers? Because I do that a lot in my presentations. Yes. And I make a list of questions, and I pick the best ones with what I know would be the best answer, and almost majority of my audience says, I'm just asking, what is that a good idea? Yeah, I think it is It is a strategy. Asking a question is a strategy. What we're saying re really is know your purpose of doing that. So if there is an actual elaborate response to it, maybe your speech will not be the place to ask that question. It might be something that's going to be a follow-up, mm -hmm. right, or at the end of your speech. But if it's just a yes or no thing to get a, to get a vibe for the room, then that's something that you can do as long as it's relevant again. So of course, if you anticipate that most people will agree. So if I'm going to come up here, the speech is about public speaking and anxiety, whatever, everything. And then I'm just like, how many of you have wake surfs in your life? Like, it might, again, it's a question. It's a, wait, it might, you might think it's an odd question to be asking over here, but it's a question. So, the, but there is no connection to what I'm trying to say. So that's really what we're saying. We're not saying that you shouldn't use it. In fact, it's a good way. Mm -hmm. If done effectively, it is a way of gaining attention because people would be like already engaging with the content before you even actually talked about anything. They're already thinking about something. You're setting the tone but it needs to be done in a way that you can actually anticipate. So if you're gonna find people who are not interested in something and you ask, are you interested in, I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> well, I'm it's sorry, so personal, I'm not. <laughs> so that, if that happens, then you know, you're, you're gonna lose your audience. So that's ineffective choice. Yeah. So that's for direct questions. Then you can have a rhetorical questions, factoids, so quick fact uh, that's just going, going to be interesting. Obviously, so all of these things, again, it's about being relevant for what you have to say next, right? You you are opening your speech, so you're setting the tone, you're opening it like into the topic. So that's the point. Obviously, it has to be relevant with the rest uh, of your speech. An anecdote or a short, short story, also a very, very common way of like beginning a presentation because it's effective we like to listen to stories if you watch a TED talk it's often going to start with some type of story um, now the thing is you can choose to have that story as sort of a metaphor throughout your speech and in that way like the story is going to com come back um, but if you're just using a quick story to get into your topic at the beginning make sure that you don't spend like 10 minutes elaborating on that and then move on to the actual content of your speech so make it, um, what's the word, proportional with, with, with what you're trying to do there. Yeah. Um, quotation, I guess. It's quotes, if you find a relevant quote yeah. to your, sorry, you didn't, did you want to? No, no, no. I guess. <laughs> um, visualization, so visualization, you gave an example, is where you go, imagine that you're, and then you're describing something. And so it, it engages the audience because like people are prompted to think about something or imagine something. Um, I find that visualization can be really, really effective. Again, has to be relevant, like tied to the actual content and purpose of your speech. Yeah. And then current event and historical events. 
No, I mean, I think these are just a laundry list, right? It always depends on what, it's good to know that these are the options, that these are some things that I might look at. So if, it, if your research is very topical, it's very like current, uh, I know that it's a lot of my uh, writing and my, uh, my own research, which works with climate change literature, I often make reference to current events. I always, like, when I can speak about something uh, that I'm writing, I always talk about an event that just occurred because it really gets people to think about how it is today a thing that's affecting people, right? So even if my talk, I mean, I, ideally my talk will touch on that, th or that uh, story or that piece again. Uh, I won't just be like, this happened yesterday in Fiji and like, just like not talk about it again. Uh, but it's, I think it's important to think about all these different options that you have. So when you're bringing your topic to your audience, what might be effective? My, for me, it was useful to bring people's attention to climate. Uh, and the events around the world. So because I work with that literature, for me, it's, it's, all, it's often the way I start uh, presenting something. Uh, not that I'm constantly presenting. <laughs> I wish I would present it more often, but what I do, that's what I do, and that's what I think of as a, as a relevant way of doing things, for, of do, presenting for my topic. And talking about how the different elements of your introduction like, can blur into each other, so starting with a fact or a relevant or a current event or a historical event is also a way of building the significance your topic so that's actually a good example yeah um, you're building your credibility it's an attention getter and you're showing why this is a relevant topic so especially when you're using events or short facts and things like that um, yeah I just thought yeah. that was a good example yeah okay so we're still working with the Titanic um, and we're just working on introductions here so we're gonna give you a type of attention getter for your speech on the Titanic. On the Titanic. <laughs> We're still working with that topic. And um, and just a few minutes to basically come up with an attention getter. Um, so based on, I think I have my prints somewhere here. Okay. I'm gonna have you pick. Yeah. Well, or inky pinky pinky pong. Like you could just randomly pick. It's not actually deliberately. Yes. Uh, attention getter for that. 
visualization <laughs> and I'm visualizing myself uh, coming out of my room on the Titanic outdoors <laughs> uh, just to get some fresh air in the middle of the night <laughs> and I see this iceberg like just hanging out and like we don't seem to be changing direction the next thing I know I'm freezing uh, <laughs> underneath the water in the polar ice caps so uh -oh. that's not where I wanted to be then the story kind of follows Develops. I would imagine myself doing that thing on oh, the yeah, Titanic. Yeah, like... If I had to visualize, that would be my first position. <laughs> imagine I'm accepting my fate. Now. Imagine you are Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, that was just like, <laughs> that was really good. Okay. Um, so yeah, just ways to think about attention getters and like possible, so many different ways that you could just get your audience's attention at the beginning of a speech. So, briefly conclusions, we don't have a lot of things to say about conclusions, but conclusions, I think you covered that pretty well. Um, One thing, though, uh, because it ties back to what I was saying, to reinforce, when you're having, I'm sorry if I'm kind of rushing, no, no, that, okay, <laughs> because I said this, whatever you said as your anecdote or your uh, initial question or your current event or whatever it is that you chose as your attention getter, it might be a very good, it might be advisable for you to come back to it in, in your conclusion. conclusion. Yeah. And that's where we talk about like reference back to the introduction. Yeah. So you're drawing your uh, speech full circle by doing this, right? You're telling them to think about something at the start of your uh, speech or to, you know, giving them a story. But then coming back to it can really give, reinforce again the point of the whole journey that they went on basically with you on the speech. So that's, if there's one thing that I want, I would want to like, always see in a, in a conclusion is that like why did we start where we started and where we ended so you might not have like a memorable note like a powerful message to kind of you yeah. know a call to action not every speech will have that but going back to where you started can really be a way of giving them a sense like kind of signaling to their brain that okay this is about conclusion now because we're going back to where we started and that usually means you've done a circle done the loop right Mm -hmm. that, that really helps uh, prompt. Again, you're not telling them in conclusion. You don't have to tell them in conclusion, this is what. You're not writing a paper. You're making a speech, right? So you, you can do that. You can do that by prompting them to think about the fact that you're actually concluding. I wonder how that would work with your visualization. <laughs> that would be tough. <laughs> would be now I'm going back to my room. <laughs> <Right. laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I think that was that probably one of the main, like, most important things about conclusions, I think it's a really good tip to go back to something that you mentioned in the introduction as a nice way of like bookending your speech. 
And then the classic like summary of your main points is always good at the end. Again, like summarize your key takeaways. What is it that you want your audience to remember by the end of your speech? Three simple, like I don't know, if you have three main points, you can have that in three, four, five sentences. That doesn't have, it doesn't have to be very long, but um, summarizing your key, your key points at the end. Yeah, memorable note, great if you have one, not really indispensable, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, if you're trying to yeah, entertain it's and be charismatic, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Moving on, visual yeah. aids. Okay. Visual aids. Again, uh, so visual aids, we are not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Like, your grad students, you know how to use visual aids. We feel like that all of that is going to be very, like things that you probably know and that are fairly straightforward and intuitive. Um, visual aids obviously matter because they help to clarify your speech, maintain the audience's attention. Your audience is going to remember better with images and other types of visuals. And Photographic memory, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember what they see better sometimes. And it is more engaging to watch a presentation or a speech with when you have like a speaker and visual aids. So why they matter, pretty, pretty straightforward. So just a few tips for PowerPoint and Google Slides. Again, that's going to be things that you've probably covered. So we're, we're not, we're just gonna- Yeah, we can kind of breeze through them yeah. really quickly. Yeah, keep them simple. Busy slides are distracting and confusing. So. Um, sometimes it's tricky. So, for example, the 3MP is difficult, a difficult exercise for that because you only have one slide and you have to have your entire presentation on there somehow. Um, but generally, you want to keep your slides simple. So that means you don't want to have lengthy paragraphs combined with images, combined with like some type of hard data. I don't know. Yeah. Um, just simple and visually engaging. Yeah. Avoid reading lengthy slides. It's just, it's just boring. When Don't just have to, uh, put every word they're gonna say on the slide, basically. And we know this. It's a, it's a very intuitive thing when we watch somebody make a speech. They're like, you're just reading everything that's down there. But we do it. It's, yeah. a, it's a thing that we tend to because we want to make it less, make, make ourselves less anxious. So why don't I just put all the words there so I will never forget? Definitely. But your speech will not go well. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing, right? Um, the other thing I do think, so if you're going to use block quotes, if you want to like highlight something about what someone said, uh, it is okay to have words on there. It's just having a purpose. So I, if I have a block quote when I'm making a conference presentation, highlight the part of that big quote that I am emphasizing in my presentation. And something as simple as that visually prompts your audience to look at just those words. What am I emphasizing? It's a bunch of words. I don't have enough time to listen to you and read it, but I can at least skim through the highlighted part. So I can see what you are really trying to emphasize in that quote. The message is not lost on that. So again, be more pur purposeful and intentional about why exactly is that quote on there. It's very useful. Um, not, and not for you alone, for your audience, right? What are they, again, gonna get out of reading that or looking at that? Keep them visually engaging. So again, that's about mostly about images. Um, a format that works really well is having one image and a few like maybe keywords, because it helps with memorization when you have images. And then don't get too crazy with visual effects. Um, yeah, all of the transitions, the, the like weird fonts or inconsistent fonts, like I guess you want to go for consistency and um, simple designs in general. Yeah. But yeah. So when you're dealing with um, trying to present a large a sizable data set, numbers specifically. Words are easier to like maintain and maybe summarize and try to, you know, like you were saying, keywords and stuff. But numbers are not something that you can always omit. Yeah. How would you, what would you recommend when you're dealing with a large data set? So you, I would assume that there is a format in which you have actually processed that data. It's not raw data, right? Like mm -hmm. it's data that you've actually processed and you're presenting on it. Oh, unless it's like a weekly check it with your advisor. Yeah, it, uh, like in situ yeah. Little situations like where obviously we have graphical data, like everything's already on a graph, but the yeah. problem is there's still so much data, even the graph looks a little bit, you know, okay. clustered. Yeah. The what? question then would be, can you make that, uh, can you simplify it? Now the graph in your dissertation or in your actual publication can be one thing, but can you actually do it for a speech? Can you create a different visual representation of that same data in, you know, in different parts? So there can be one table and one, uh, line graph that talks about the same thing. Uh, that's something to be more intentional about. So you might have a different 
piece in your research paper, but make the presentation with simpler data that's visually, because ultimately you're not using visual data to prove that you've done the work. You're doing it so people can understand. So if you're just going to be like, oh, here's, they could just read your research paper then, right? They could be like, I'm gonna just, you know, print out your copy of your paper and then just read that and understand it. And because here they're not having, they don't have enough time to actually process it. So if it's possible and you have time, these are obviously contingent on that, right? If you have enough time, actually take the time to simplify that data visually for your audience. Um, if you can represent it in a different format, then do that. Um, these are these are things to to consider when you're talking about communicating well. Um, so yeah, that would be my. I would also say it depends on your audience. So if you're presenting for your coworkers and it's like a work meeting, for example, and you know that these people are illiterate with the kind of graph that you're going to show them, and they're not, it's not going to take time for them to process the information, then you might not need to adapt as much, right? But if if it's depending on, on the context, if, if you're trying to present your data to a general audience, then definitely adapt that to simplify it. Another thing about that is, um, and something that we see so often in presentations, you have graphical data, um, and, and the speaker would go like, as you can see here, and quite the conclusion. <laughs> But like, like if, you actually, yeah, if you actually have a graph and data on your slide, then spend time on it and engage with it. Because um, it's not, if it's just there for you, for you to show us that you've done the work and that it's somewhere on the graph, it, has, it doesn't actually help. So if you're gonna have complex graphical data, spend time with it, engage with it, so that the audience can follow and understand. Yeah. At least, maybe sometimes it's very technical and that's challenging, um, but still like, <laughs> you should, you should not just acknowledge the thing and then... Yeah, don't breeze it. past it. Yeah. It's not going to accomplish the purpose. I also do think that highlighting the, the idea about quotes that I just said, highlighting a piece, uh, so if it's a tabular, whatever, representation of it, you can highlight the section that you're again focusing on in your presentation, right? So what is really consequential about all of that data? Because obviously some things are more emphasized, right? You, you can have the entire um, data set, but then you're still kind of like looking at the conclusion, what that really means. So you can highlight it, you can bold it or something so that people's attention are again prompted to look at that section of that um, graph. Yes. Can I add to that point? I do that really often is uh, just to add data or let's say in our statistical analysis, you would only mean in standard deviation or standard error. If I have let's say three groups and only one of my group has uh, seen and seen differences, I just put one group. And then I would not put the other group because they are not significant at all because that will just confuse everyone. And I'll just say, okay, this is the only group where I saw a difference, and the other groups I don't. And if I have multiple groups where I see differences, then I'll highlight the boxes. Just pull boxes down or whatever animation you want to see. So that will just focus. So you don't want to go through all data, you just focus on that. That's my suggestion. And it has worked yeah. really well for me. Oh, no, that makes sense. Yeah. What is consequential? You have to you have to bring that attention. Again, the point is communicating better. Mm -hmm. The point is that then it's not about giving them all the data, it's about giving them the data that they will take away from what you're saying. Yeah. That's basically what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll yeah. Talk about it. <laughs> okay, that's our last point here. This is our last point. Yes. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, you want to talk about this real quick? Yeah, so we do this so that we can understand, again in the context, how you're going to make the speech. Uh, there are a number of ways in which you will make speech, uh, make a speech or something like a speech in your life. There's impromptu where I'm just asking you to share your thoughts on something in a classroom. So I'll give you five minutes and I'll call on somebody to share your thoughts on that piece of uh, article that we read. Uh, it's not a speech speech, but it is anyway, nonetheless you want to be eloquent. You want to have something to say, you want to have a point to make. Uh, there are ways of doing that. Um, usually in impromptu, you don't want to say much. You don't, you're don't. you not expected to say too much. So one or two things that you noticed about an article or about whatever the topic is, that's going to be, should be your emphasis. Uh, in impromptu speaking, another thing is thank you for you know giving me the opportunity. And it depends how formal the situation is. If it's a classroom and I'm just asking you to, maybe you don't have to say that. But if it's something that you have to come up front in the class and then present and you can thank the person who asked you, be like, thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts on this. And then you go on to say, I'm going to talk about two things that I noticed about this thing. And then you can you can lay it out like that. But don't go too, don't dump too much information. Don't be like, oh, I got a whole analysis 
of this for you. You don't have that much time, it's impromptu, right? It's probably not gonna be more than five minutes that you get to speak on. So break it down. What are my two or three major thoughts on this? Mm. What can I say about it? Also because it's impromptu, you don't really have that much time to actually think, like process your thoughts. So you really wanna have like one or two main ideas, but you don't wanna try to include everything because you're just gonna digress and it's gonna be confusing. So go straight to your point and stick to that or your two points. Yeah. But you don't, yeah. yeah, we're not asking for just for like the 20 minute dissertation on something. Yeah. <laughs> then there is the manuscript where you're actually writing word for word and everything. It works for some people, but you have to be very proficient with making manuscripts of speech because more often than not, you'll, you'll find people just so the next thing I'm gonna like no reading right. Yeah. So you have to be somebody like politicians do this a lot. They have teleprompters. They'll have a whole speech written, but they're engaging nonetheless. They talk to their audience. They're not just like you know that's not that's not what's happening, right? So that's important to know because my, we might feel like oh I'm more confident because my entire speech is written word for word and I'm just gonna read it. It couldn't. There's no way it could go wrong. Actually, there's every way it could go wrong because you're not even paying attention to what you're actually asked to do. Right? So don't manuscript your speech as much, as tempting as it looks. And if you feel like you want to do that, do it as a stage of preparation. So write the whole damn manuscript, then process it into an outline, then process it into note cards, and then, so go through the stages that are required for you to be confident about your speech. But don't just manuscript it and think that you can just read it out and people will get the point. That doesn't happen. And if, you're, if you're writing a script or a manuscript for, for your speech, the danger is that you're gonna, so writing style and oral style are different. If you're writing a speech, like you're writing the entire script, your style is gonna be written. And then that's not going to translate when you're delivering the speech because the way we write is more complex. We write longer sentences with complex, more complex structure uh, than when we're speaking. So it's a different type, it's a different style really. And if you're just reading something that you wrote, um, it's not going to be engaging because uh, sentences are going to be longer, the structures and the syntax is going to be more complicated, so it's harder to follow in the end, and so that's a risk. So if you do have to write a script, that's fine, maybe the occasion prompts for that, but you have to keep in mind that you're writing as though, like you're writing for speaking. It's a different task, it's a different exercise than writing for something to be read, right? So that's One thing I do if I do manuscript something is, um, at least to check my intonation, I will bold the, the parts. So when this happens, so I, I you know I bold the word when if, I, if I'm writing something like that. So that it, it's not that it's not to say the manuscript. It is a way of delivering a speech. It is a way of giving a speech. It's just not the best for not people who are not very used to it, not proficient yeah. with it. And then if you are, then you might use strategies in your writing itself that can allow you to be more oral and make sure that you're not actually just monotonous, like you're not sounding like some robot regurgitating a few words, right? That's, that's important. And then there's memorized. The real short answer to memorized speeches, like whether you should do it or not, is no. <laughs> because it's tricky. You are putting your, signing up for something that is, you, you are going to be nervous, either before or during or after your speech. And memorized speech will raise the stakes like 100%, right? It's just gonna be like, if I forget one word, I'm done. It derails I would just, it will completely, I lose entirely what, I, what comes after. So memorizing, no. Use aids, and that's what, that's what's going to bring us to extemporaneous. I'm going to give some tips on how to do extemporaneous speaking or how to practice doing that. Um, you can write the manuscript and translate it into note cards, as I said. So we'll talk about how to write note cards well. Um, so yeah, I think extemporaneous is basically using aids, but not actually reading out entirely your speech, right? Yeah, I think okay. we can do that. <laughs> no. Okay. I think we talked about all this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I <guess laughs> this is an image, and I want you to think of a one minute. I, why did? Why is it here? It was here the whole time. Yeah, but why? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, this is like transparency going on from the middle. Did you have another slide? No, 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 no. But I, what are what are? Do have to make an anecdote? Oh yes. So okay, <laughs> let me give you the prompt. You have a picture, a beautiful picture, taken by Dina. <laughs> and um, we're, we're just going to give you a few minutes, and we want a one-minute anecdote. So it doesn't have to be exactly one minute. But basically, make up a story based off of that picture. Okay? So we're, remember, we're, we're talking about speaking style and delivery. We're just 
talked about with Moed, so with this, going to be kind of impromptu, also with the use of a narrative, okay? So just a quick exercise. Um, you can make up whatever story inspires you looking at it. <laughs> we'll just give you like two minutes maybe. Yeah. Okay. Again, you can, work, you can work together, you can like think in your head, whatever, and then we'll ask somebody to share. <laughs> You get that, but the monkey's always hungry. <laughs> so you're not really taking any risks here. Just a quick humor. And then Dina will share the real story. I will share the real story. <laughs> you know that. So try to think in terms of wording, uh, how you're going to how, how you're going to start your story, what your main message is going to be, so what what essentially it curates the story, so what this, the, the story is going to be, and it had to be a really short one, so try to think about how you can organize that. Jumping at them. Very inspiring that picture, don't you think? <laughs> Any story? Like, what's going on with that? I guess I'll go. <laughs> I like to think of it as a way, as it's like a perfect balance between like humanity and nature, right? It's like you think about like somewhere behind that monkey, there's a whole rat race of humanity going on, but this monkey is just taking its time and like trying to also find its place. So I think there's, it just for me, it just kind of looks like a perfect summation of like the balance between how humanity has to work well with nature. And yeah, that's what, that's what I'm feeling. All right. That's the, that's the vibe I'm getting. Anyone else? I love that in relation to the actual yeah, story. Yeah, to the actual story. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear it. Yeah. All right. Do you want to like this? Again, you start maybe to uh, humans have actually destroyed uh, a forest and monkeys that are trying to survive in the sea. Because mm. it's out of this place mm. we're really now. Taking too many things for granted here, but all right. Oh, you yeah, guys really made that philosophical. <laughs> yeah, it's like so deep and like, oh, yeah. I've seen, we gotta work on it. It's, uh, it's cool, it's cool though. It's cool yeah. that that's the thing that it gives you. Anybody else before we can, yeah. Um, okay, just a funny thought it just took this. So, you know how like when humans want some calm or serenity, they usually like venture out into the desert forest for a safari or something like that, but uh, animals try to do the same, so they try to venture out from the forest and into the city, but then even in the city they just keep getting distant. Let's, ch let's check this thing called civilization. Yeah. What is the real deal about yeah. this thing? <laughs> Going up to the height. Yeah, well, okay. Right. Interesting. So the story really is, I was hiking for several hours uh, in India, in Rajasthan, which is a state in India. And uh, this picture was taken at this place called the Monkey Temple. And the number of monkeys there are over, the, I think over 10,000 monkeys. It's a temple dedicated to monkeys. So it's not humans taking over monkeys, it's monkey ta monkeys taking over humans. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and the reason the monkey is annoyed is because I was eating peanuts because I had been hiking for three hours. So I had a bag of peanuts in my hand and he steals it and I go after him. I don't know why, I was just, I was hangry too, all right? So I go after him and then he's like hissing at me because I, well, I'm not going to steal his peanuts, but I wanted to prove a point. I wanted to make my point. So I went behind him and then he was like, you're not going to get your peanuts back. So I don't know, I don't think you see the bag of monkeys, uh, bag of monkeys, bag of peanuts. Maybe he dropped it in the process. 
But that's the real story. The harmony between humans and animals is really the story there. Yeah, it was not quite so much. philosophical. It's quite a stretch. <laughs> not very philosophical, just very adventurous. Okay. Okay, thanks for your thought provoking uh, philosophical points, anyway. Okay, so we're still on speaking style and delivery. Uh, one thing that matters in public speaking is going to be preciseness and clarity in the way you speak. So we thought, because this is a STEM school and most people use very technical terms, um, that a general audience would probably well, struggle with. Yeah. Um, we thought we would ask you to come with a simple and acceptable definition of a microwave in your own words. Um, and honestly, I don't know how I would go about this, right? <laughs> I don't have well, any we don't have the definition. So yes. we don't have the answer to this yes. one. For people who have studied some basic physics in this classroom, I believe, most of you? No. Not me. <laughs> Not me either. Well, that's why we're asking for the definition. How would you define something as mundane as the microwave? Yeah. You got an answer? My own definition, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. your own definition. How would you explain it? A closed box which water or any other fluids take with passion because it makes them go into a different state from being ah. used to obviously. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. I'm pretty sure there are official definitions of this thing. <laughs> unless, unless this is a groundbreaking revelation or something. Anybody else wants to take a jog at it? I'm not on it. Okay, well, let's hear it. The easiest way to warm your food. Okay, so that's yeah. the actual product, the microwave, mm -hmm. not the microwaves. Oh, okay. But the microwave. Yeah, well, that's fair. That's, that's an interpretation. Um, obviously, what was something we were trying to go uh, towards the technical aspect of it, which was like if you were somebody, a physicist, trying to explain to somebody what microwaves are, how would you do it? And that's. So the point there is really about jargons, speaking style and jargons. Like, how do you um, think about when you're communicating with your audience, translating something that's so obvious to you, something might, that does not require a definition. You've studied for so long, you don't need to be reminded what it means, right? But in a speaking context, sometimes doing a, something as simple as adding one sentence that defines the framework that you're working with can make all the difference. It can enable your audience to understand the rest of your 10 minutes of speech. So that's, again, something to think about if you're going to define or if you're going to redefine. If your research, for example, uh, since we're in this grad school context, if, you're if your research redefines some parameters of your, of your field in some way, then here's how I define this. You know, you use that. Like, so in my, my own work, I define this framework or this concept as such and such. And that can be really helpful because you might in your head think, oh, that's, that's just implied because the rest of my message kind of talks about it. But nothing's implied. If it requires, if it's going to help your audience understand something better, then don't take the implicate, like the implied part of it. Be explicit. Don't imply. <laughs> so that's really um, the kind of the highlight for this. I'd say yeah, a general rule. Well, not rule. I don't like. Well, I don't. I feel like there are always exceptions to rules, right? But a general, um, a general thing when you're in any kind of public speaking situation. Um, so especially more if it's technical and complex, but also in general, you have you are going to have central concepts in your speech that you're going to come back to and refer to. And it's really, it's really crucial, even though you think they are simple, that you provide a definition at least once at the beginning. So all of your, when you're preparing for a speech, like try to identify what concepts are really key and central to what you're saying and provide acceptable definitions. And find, again, a balance between simple and simplistic. Right, so you want to make it accessible, but you don't also want to sound condescending or like your audience can't understand something that is complex. So find that balance between simplicity um, and simplicity of what you're determining. So yeah, so essentially for, for definitions. Yeah, and sometimes you, if you don't need definitions, an image can do the work, right? Like sometimes if you're like talking about human anatomy, I don't know, maybe just pointing out, you don't need to define what a, 
lung is. <laughs> I mean, maybe just having a right. sign for being that basic, my anatomy knowledge is there. <laughs> but that's the point. Like sometimes visually you can do it just with an image that kind of points to what really is being emphasized. Yeah. So think about it again, how are you gonna help your audience understand what you're speaking of? I think we covered this. <laughs> Jargon's euphemisms. Okay, so just very quick um, things, again, kind of tying back to becoming too technical. Avoiding jargons means, again, providing, uh, providing definitions, providing explanations where required. And this will, again, take you, to, take you back to what do my audience, uh, who is my audience, what do they know, and what can they expect to know during my speech. Um, so that can help, and then you'll understand that, oh, well, I'm using this, but it's really only electrical engineers that use this term. Maybe I need to tell them what, what, that, what that means, or something like that, right? So if you're gonna be that, if you're gonna do that, then thinking about audience will allow you to make certain linguistic choices which you would not have made um, if you had not thought about it like that. Um, don't euphemize sometimes, well this is kind of generic again, uh, but sometimes like de-emphasizing, um, things can be a problem, so saying, like cliches like, I don't believe success, uh, I think failure is just another way to, towards success or something like that. It, it sounds like, okay, I'm trying to make a solid point here, but sometimes it can be cliche and too euphemistic in the sense that people might not actually get, get you know, they might think that you're trying too hard. Like, so I, I know that this is a very kind of broad example, and maybe there's no concrete way in which you're thinking of it in your own speeches, but sometimes we do tend to uh, use language that's not commensurate with the emphasis. So if, if you do think that something requires to be, people need to be alerted to the importance of something, and that it's a, it is in fact a scary thing, or it is in fact something for them to be thinking about. The speech is the place where you, you can actually emphasize, you can actually emote. Uh, maybe your research writing will not be the place where you will do that, because you have to be objective and you have to kind of give them, you know, clear definitions, clear uh, statistical data, proving a certain point or whatever it is. But in your speech, you actually get to emote, right? You actually get to tell them how you feel about it. What are your feelings about what you're finding out in your research? So that, that's really what we're trying to say here, which is that your language can be an aid in that, thinking about how you might use figures of speech to bring that emotion through in your, in your speaking. Sometimes um, um, the other thing with trying to be creative, so trying to be creative with language is great. Um, you want to be vivid, you want to be specific, precise, engaging in your language. Um, there is also the place where people overdo it. So if you're trying to be overly, I don't know, metaphorical or poetic or use fancy words, uh, it can also like backfire in the sense that you either can come across as like maybe pretentious or like you're trying too hard or simply you're just inaccessible in that moment because of the words that you're using. So creative language is great, but you're not making a literature essay, <laughs> you're giving a speech to people. So. Um, yeah, again, yeah. kind of balance between that. Okay. Second language speakers. Um, this is a thing that when I gave this uh, seminar last year, people asked questions about, so I thought I would um, include it quickly. And I know, so most of us are second language, uh, I mean, second language speakers in English. Um, and it comes with challenges. So in terms of your anxiety, for example, it can definitely increase anxiety because you have to speak in front of a crowd and this is not your first language, so you're not as comfortable as you would be in your, in your first language. Um, so just a few things to remember, right? The first being everyone has an accent, even native speakers, depending on where you're from. I know it sounds really basic, but um, for me at least it's always good to like, remember, <laughs> remember that, knowing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach to an American audience mostly because that's 99% of our classrooms. Um, with an accent, like being an international student, it can, it can increase anxiety. Mistakes and mispronunci mispronunciations happen, <laughs> um, and that's fine. I think, I think when it happens, you just m mispronounce a word, or you make like a grammar mistake, or you say something, and you can just like acknowledge that and say, "Hey, let me start. Let me start over. Try again. Take your time." don't feel like you have to rush. So I think the tendency is like we rush through it because we just want to be done with it. Um, but really being able to stop and pause and just be like, listen, <laughs> I'm gonna try this word again. And I do that all the time when I teach. Like also you teach like you lecture for 20, 25 minutes. The more you speak, the more you get tired. And so your English can 
or your yeah. teaching abilities decrease a little bit. Um, so that's I'm fine. Not even sure. I, th I think it's <laughs> just something we need to normalize and really take the time to correct ourselves or pause and start again. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah. And if someone in your audience is making you feel like it is, <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's also a way of thinking about yourself as a listener, as an audience, right? It's because we do have sometimes snap judgments and we think, oh, somebody has a heavy accent, whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that we individually do, but like there is uh, a predisposition to think of something as less proficient, less fluent. So we might subconsciously be like, oh, I can't really understand, so I'm not going to engage with this. And it's important to be aware that some you might actually um, just not have tried enough. Like it's very easy if you if you make the effort and if you're conscious and you remind yourself that ultimately uh, the person's trying to communicate and that's something that's of interest to you. So it's it's kind of more of an ethical question here, right? Because communication is also ba based on a number of standards. What we think is effective communication is based on a lot of prejudices. Like showing too much emotion, oh no, that's a little bit too much. That's you shouldn't do that. They used to be historically that, right? Speech had to be very objective. You can't really show your emotions come through, uh, depending on the formality of the situation. And these things are uh, cultural, and these are you know, so women show too much emotion, and you know things like that. So there are predispositions, and being aware of what kind of uh, pre predispositions we might bring into the situation when we speak or when we are listening is very useful. Um, and it also, when you remind yourself of that as a listener, then your ability to sympathize or empathize with somebody who, are, who is making that mistake as well will, will grow. So when you're aware that you, uh, you're able to, or your ability to even desensitize yourself. So when you are being kind to somebody else and giving them the benefit of the doubt, you will learn that subconsciously you're, you're able to do that for yourself as well. Um, it's a way of thinking that shifts when you're able to do that for someone else. So, well, they're not a native speaker of English, they flip up on this word, they don't pronounce this word correctly, but I get the point. And when you're able to do that, you'll do that for yourself subconsciously. So that really helps, I think, as a more ethical aspect of communication, which is we have set standards, but we have to question them sometimes. Uh, and we have to be able to be okay with flaws. If the point is not to be flawless, the point is to be effective. And effective can be a number of ways. There are a number of ways of defining that. We only have three minutes left. I think we can we can almost wrap up. I think we're almost done, right? I mean, it is. Yeah, I don't know if uh, we. I don't really want to ask people to. Just want to. Yeah, I think. Oh yeah, we don't have to. I think this was this could be a note to close on. We all, what we had was about citation, right? The next one. Oh, this. Yeah, I think I just want to go over this really quickly yeah. before you leave. So we did tell you that extemporaneous is probably the best way. Don't memorize. Don't uh, use a manuscript. So then what options have you left? You can make an extemporaneous speech. What this means um, in practical terms is you can write up your manuscript, you can write up the entire speech, but translate it into an actual usable outline. The way I would suggest that you do it is usually you have a speech which has an introduction and a conclusion. Take for granted that you're gonna have an introduction and a conclusion, right? So have one note card for an introduction, one note card for a conclusion. Um, and if you have three main points that you want to make in your speech, then you can have one uh, index card or note card for each of those points. Uh, what it allows you to do is obviously flip. Instead of having like a large piece of paper in front of you and be like, where am I on this page now? That doesn't help. So when you're flipping, you're, you're, you, know, you have smaller pieces that actually helps you stay structured. So in your introduction, you have three bullet points on the introduction. You know when you've covered it. It's simple enough. The other thing I would say is um, so that's that's usually that's just the technicality, the logistics of of writing in your note card. But then think about translating your sentences into trigger terms, and that's where I'll close. You might have an entire sentence about one of the evidence I found in such and such person's research was that. Now, okay, that's okay for a paper. What can you say in your um, in your note card? Maybe you can just write the citation: Richardson, 2016. I don't know. And that should remind you of the research that you read from Richardson in 2016. And so that, that way you should be able to do that. And in a, in a general way, the way I uh, tell people is, um, the example I would use is, if I use the word Fukushima, what comes to mind? The nuclear disaster, what comes to mind, right? So I don't have to write the entire anecdote about the nuclear disaster. The word Fukushima will remind me of that. And then I can think of like 
another disaster in Japan, uh, say the tsunami. Now I've used one word, one trigger word, but I've reminded myself of two stories that I can connect back to that one word. So I'm not writing entire anecdotes or entire stories on a little notepad. I'm writing one word, but I know there are two things I want to say about those, that one word. So that I think is an effective way, and I think we'll, we'll close with that, because I think this is a lot of information for you to work with, and I hope you will work with it, and I hope something about this uh, helps you in your presentations. But go extemporaneous. Practice uh, with notepads. You don't have to memorize the things you are going to speak on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have any questions, we can take them now, or you can come and see us. Yeah, we have questions. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs>